My sermon this afternoon I've entitled, uh, The Way of Cain. The Way of Cain. You know, during the times of carnal warfare in various places, there can be all kinds of deceptive practices uh, by one armed force against the other and vice versa to try to stop the progress of troop transport and things like that. Road signs are sometimes changed and they're supposed to be pointing one way, but they say a town is another way and all that kind of thing. The whole idea is to confuse whoever you think the enemy is and make it easier to be able to defeat them. Of course, when you have the proper information, the proper intelligence, and the proper technology and know how to use it, then you can, in time, overcome a lot of those things. Yet people who are careless and not vigilant in the armed services can get themselves in big trouble. To go to sleep on guard duty is a death fence. All that's because people need to be warned. People need to be aware. And so it is when it comes to the army of the Lord, and each one of us is soldiers in particular. We need to be aware of the, f of the fact that we're in a fight. I think sometimes Christianity is painted as more like we're, uh, we have a feather duster trying to dust the living room or something. But no, we're in a fight. We're in a great fight. We don't use rifles and ammunition and hand grenades and tanks and airplanes, but we're in the greatest fight there is. It's a fight on God's side against all that's unholy and against he who is the very source of everything that's ungodly, the devil himself. So while we labor here to be faithful so that we can save our own souls, working out our own salvation with fear and trembling and abiding in the truth and application of the same, we must realize that this great battle that's going on is far greater than just our being faithful. And that's enough. But it's also a battle between God and Satan. It goes beyond the physical. It is something that's going to be radical as to the changes of things at the end of this age and what lies ahead when God has what is called by Peter the new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So we need to understand as we fight the fight of faith, as we seek to walk the straight and narrow way, as we seek to save our souls, that as uh, the army of the Lord, we're engaged in service under the captain of our salvation, our Savior Jesus Christ, and fighting with things that go much farther beyond uh, our saving of our own souls. I don't understand all the meaning of that when it comes to this cosmic battle that we're involved in that goes beyond the material of this world and goes out into eternity. Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and so forth. So it's far greater in our battle to abide by the truth and to be honest in the, taking the truth and applying it. So with all that in mind, you can be sure the devil is going to try to get you away from that. That's all he lives for. That's all he exists for. And when you look at the New Testament, then most of it's written to Christians to keep us faithful. And in his brief letter, Jude warns his readers to beware of the tactics of the devil. And Paul had even said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. I sometimes think we ought to say that we shouldn't be ignorant of Satan's devices, but I fear because of lack of Bible study, serious Bible study, sometimes we don't realize how he operates. In life, Christians must choose ever so carefully which road they travel and on that road how they travel it. So to help Christians then and now to be alert to this fact, the inspired Jews writing part of the New Testament begins his thought, it's a bit peculiar, but he begins his thought with woe. Not W-H-O-A, when you say to a horse to stop him, but W-O-E, woe. We can say that that word and what it means is a very arresting word and really a very serious word. In Jesus' ministry concerning Capernaum and Bethsaida, he pronounced a woe against them, Matthew 11, 21 through 24, because of how much had been done in their presence that places like Sodom and Gomorrah had never seen. And he makes comments like, if all the mighty works had done in you had been done in them, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Which means you've had far greater opportunity, far greater benefit, far greater evidence 
far more working for you, yet you've neglected it. And so a woe is placed upon those cities who turn down this much uh, more good things to help them serve God. They had neglected a unique opportunity. They had been blessed with the Son of God in the flesh walking among them. The world had never seen that before. All of God's people previous to that had never experienced the Messiah walking with them. It's in that word a reproach and a warning that is combined. In other words, in one word, it's combined, woe unto you. And Jude applies this word to those who were teaching false doctrine. And thereby they were troubling the elect of God, the church. As much as I try to understand the gravity and evilness and the hurt of false doctrine, I don't know that any of us really do. I wish we could understand it and see it as God sees it. And I try. And I work toward it. And as far as understanding it better than some people, I'm sure I do. But as to seeing it in the way, as to the evilness of it, like I would like to, I don't know that I do. All I know is you can't teach false doctrine to save people with it. False doctrine condemns to a devil's hell. It's a tool of Satan. False doctrine doesn't glorify God. False doctrine brings you down to hell. Now, the reason for this strong language was that these false teachers of the day in which Jude was writing, it's the same true today of false teachers now, were walking the same crooked path, and he names three of them. Three very notorious false teachers who are recording in the Old Testament. Now, pause here and say again, what's in the Old Testament was written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. And those three people are false teachers, bad people, are Cain, Balaam, and Korah. So the inspired Jude used this trio as an example of what not to be, not to be. And he exhorted his readers, that's us and those originally was written, to choose a higher level of life, a higher road of life, a life that is in harmony with the teaching of the gospel of Christ. So I say in this sermon, we want to look at what we are calling the way of Cain. The way of Cain. And that comes from Jude's own words. In other words, the words the Holy Spirit gave him in writing this letter for our benefit. Cain chose the wrong path, and he paid dearly for his error. Jude marks Cain's path with warning signs. And that's where we're headed with this. Jude marks Cain's path with warning signs. There's a reason. So that we who read will not wander off into the path of these men, especially Cain. So let's see if we can identify these warning signs. It's not hard. They're taught elsewhere in the Bible as a bad thing. The first one we'll notice is self-will. Do you ever sit down and ask yourself, am I a self-willed person? And if you do, you're going to have to say, well, what does it mean to be self-willed? It really, we would say it this way, it comes down to where I'm going to have my way at all costs, no matter what, regarding no matter who. Now, I dare say people don't really say that to themselves. They don't really come out and say, I'm going to have my way no matter what it does to you, no matter what hurt it does to you, no matter what hurt it does to anybody else, and for that matter, whatever hurt it does to me. Uh, you can see sometimes little children who are so self-willed and they're determined to do what their parents had told them to do and they just are in a fight to do it and they get out there and get in the middle of it and end up hurting themselves. Children are known to do that. But God's children who are mature should have learned better than that a long time ago. The way of Cain first came to light when he and his brother were offering sacrifices to God. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. You'll remember that Abel sacrificed the best of his flock and the Lord favored his sacrifice because it was offered according to the teaching of God. It was a faithful act. Cain brought of the produce of the ground and God did not accept it. The difference between the two offerings is seen in Hebrews chapter 11, 4. Abel offered unto God by faith a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And by it... He obtained a good report. 
Well, as I said this morning when we were talking about Hebrews 11, you wouldn't need any more than Hebrews 11 to understand that faith apart from works is dead and that faith that's acceptable to God is obedient faith. And so here we have it again in Hebrews 11, 4, written in the New Testament to help you and to help me so that we will not become self-willed. My will is just not that important when it comes to it hindering me from knowing the will of heaven as it's presented in the words of Christ. The excellence of Abel's sacrifice is simply, and again, this is an extension of our lesson this morning, in that it was offered by faith. The faith comes with hearing the word of God. So God's word had instructed Abel and Cain how to offer it. Why didn't Cain do what Abel did? Well, I would suggest to you he was going to have it his way. He was self-willed. So Abel was pleasing to God. The only way anybody can be pleasing to God, he obeyed God's commandments from the heart. Now, Cain, I don't know, but he may have felt that his produce was as good as uh, as, or, or possibly better than the sacrifice offered by Cain, or rather by Abel. But whatever he thought, what he did was to violate God's will. And regardless of Cain's intent, then, his act was disobedience. And that's very important. To understand. Some people say, well, my intent was this, my intent was that. Well, I don't care what your intent was. When your actions cause you to violate God's will, that's what matters. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, the great prophet Samuel said to Saul, who was disobeying God but declaring that he was doing God's will, but Samuel just simply told him, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of ram. And that ties in with the fear of God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Whenever man substitutes his own will for that of God's, guess what he's doing? He's walking the way of Cain. Now there's little doubt that Cain's sin commenced with an improper disposition of mind, a wrong attitude. And what was the result of it? A disobedient act. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7, John addresses Christians with this. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. I don't know how to be righteous like God is righteous except that I do what is righteous. And that's what John's saying. You can know whether you're acceptable to God or not. Abel knew. Abel knew very well that he had done what God told him to do and the way God told him to do it and for the reason God told him to do it. And so can we. And there's that example in the very beginning of things that teaches us what it is to be faithful to God. By failing to do what God commanded, then Cain showed himself unrighteous. So one of the ways that we walk in the way of Cain is to be self-willed. Another warning sign that comes up from a study of Cain it's resentment. I think I have been around enough in my family and dealing with myself and dealing with members of the church and all the various problems that arise in everybody's life, and that is people resent things. Cain was upset that God rejected his offering. And his downcast face, if you will call it that, uh, revealed how bitter he was. Well, what was the fault? It wasn't Abel's fault. Abel heard God's word, understood it, from the heart obeyed it. Cain did what he wanted to. He was self-willed, and he offered that sacrifice, said, you'll like it whether that's what you all asked me to do or not. Well, God didn't accept it. Well, what did it do for, for Cain? Should have made him humble himself. Should have made him say, I did wrong. Should have made him repent. But he didn't. He resented the whole thing. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament offered excellent counsel for a person with Cain's state of mind or bad attitude. He wrote it to the church in Ephesus, in chapter 4, and verse 26, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down your wrath. I would say the sun went down on Cain's wrath. And it became embittered. Why was he angry? God wouldn't accept his sacrifice. Well, why wouldn't God accept his sacrifice? Because he hadn't obeyed God. So sometimes we're the victims of our own life. He would have never been angry if he'd had a humble attitude and done what God told him to. But he wanted to have it his own way. So he did as he pleased. He was rejected, and he resented it. 
Have you ever seen that pattern in people's lives? Christians must learn to manage their emotions to constructive ends. I think we heard a good lesson on that from Eric. And from other times we have studied how God expects us to be sober-minded, that we are to be uh, self-controlled. You remember when Paul preached one time, he preached of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Used to, back when they fought alcohol a hundred years ago and led to prohibition, they had temperance societies. Well, that's self-control. That's exercising your control over yourself from a sane mind. Well, alcohol doesn't give you too much of a sane mind, so they call those opposed to alcohol being sold as temperance societies. Well, we're taught in the Bible whatever messes up our mind from thinking straight so that we can control ourselves like we ought to, it's intemperate. And so much is said about being sober-minded. Some people, I think, because they associate sober with alcohol, think Paul's saying, don't get drunk. But whatever can mess up the way that you think normally as God made you to think and as you think objectively in accordance with the standard that is the New Testament, if you're handicapped in that and you've done it to yourself, then whose fault is it? So those who live at the mercy of their emotions are traveling the way of Cain. Now, who, who gave you your emotions? Who made you with emotions? Well, it was God, wasn't it? Didn't he give you all of your appetites that are peculiar to the flesh and that are needful here? Well, now that I say that, who regulates those emotions? Who teaches you as a free moral agent with the power of choice to do right or wrong? Who tells you how to use them? Who tells you how to limit them? Who tells you how to do thus and so? Well, it's God. So he gave us these things. Therefore, he regulates these things. Now, how does he regulate it? We must want to regulate it. We must want him to have his way with us. And so Jesus, who physically emotional and dreading the pain of the cross, said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, why did he go to the cross? Not my will. Let thy be done. The Lord attempted to reason with Cain. I wish we would learn this lesson. Don't try to reason with people who are unreasonable. Don't try to reason with unreasonable people. And when he tried to reason with Cain, it was to no avail. So there's a lesson in the origin of things of what to do about that. Listen to Genesis 4 verse 6. God asked him a question. I don't teach you some way to get along with people. You don't have to come up and say, Cain, you're angry. God knew he was angry. But look what God did in the way he approached him. He said, why are you angry? Now, that put the focus on what's happening in your mind that you would be angry that your sacrifice was not accepted. It should have caused him to think soberly and say, well, I didn't do what you told me to. But it didn't work that way, did it? If he was upset with anyone, guess who he should have been upset with? He should have been upset with himself. And that's the way it is. Listen to me, brethren. With about everybody that sins against God but doesn't want to admit their sin, they're going to point a finger and say, Eric, it's your fault. They're going to point somebody else and say, Ken, it's your fault. Say, it's your fault. It's everybody's fault but the one that is at fault. It's as old as the beginning of time. Well, of course, Cain had seen some of that because his daddy had said, the woman thou gavest me, she did give me, and I did eat. Now, if we know that about ourselves, and we know we're free moral agents, and we know we can be self-willed, you think we ought to do something about it? You think we to be forewarned is to be forearm here in the beginning of God's revelation and the very early part of the unfolding of the scheme of redemption that tells us much about ourselves. Those who blame others for their problems therefore are traveling in the way of Cain. God encouraged Cain to change his course while there was still time and that's what we're doing. If you're righteous in the church doing what God said the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular ought to do, you're doing your best to say, change things while there's still time. 
Because the only place to change is in time. When time's no more, no more change. If he started doing what was right, guess what? God would accept him, wouldn't he? So it is now, no matter what sins a person's involved in, that may have come because I just want to do it. It's my way of doing it, and I want to have my way. When you come to the conclusion you need to lay your way aside and do what God said, then God's ready to receive you. That is a wonderful thought. If I'll just use the sense God gave me and submit to his will, guess what God's going to do? He's going to receive me, having forgiven me of every sin. Now, if not, sin was ready to pounce on Cain like a hungry lion stalking his prey. And that's what he tells him. If you're so determined to press your way, though it's contrary to God's will, and you're angry about it, then guess what? Satan's got you. There's always, God says, the way to escape your faith being tried, to escape temptation. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 that with every temptation, a way of escape is made. The problem is we get so set on doing things our ways, we can't see the door that's open for us to go through. Remember this, whether you see it or not, whether I see it or not, with every temptation, a way of escape is there. So it's a matter of us knowing our Bible well enough and being in self our, our self uh, controlled to where we see it. This means that those who follow the way of Cain do so by their own choice. Instead of listening to God's advice, what did Cain do? Go back and read the record. Well, he clung to his anger. And where did that lead him? He got his brother off out in the field and killed him. Whenever a person fills his heart with evil, eventually, to one extent or the other, it will reveal it itself. It will express itself in some way or another. Evil hearts or a walking time bomb waiting to go off. Inward difficulties for yourself physically and mentally, maybe ulcer, heart attacks, high blood, whatever it may be, you can exacerbate those things just by wanting it your way the whole time, making your body fit into your category of things. And I don't know of anything that would frustrate anybody any more than that to try to make everybody do it your way. Because I can tell you this much, everybody's not going to do it your way. And that's going to frustrate you. Because you're trying to get everybody, like getting your ducks in a row, you're trying to get everybody up to where they go along with you. They do whatever you like. And how many times does that cause problems in so many homes? But it causes problems everywhere. It'll bring about hurtful speech. It'll bring about physical violence. In any of these cases, anger harms the one in whom it dwells more than the one to whom it is directed. That's why we have let not the sun go down on your anger. It's rightly true that there's an anger that's not sinful. But you must keep yourself so controlled that as you're angry, you don't violate God's will. When Jesus saw these folks get beside themselves over him healing a man's arm on the Sabbath day, the Bible says, and I would have out of curiosity liked to have seen the expression on his face, when it says he looked around about upon them with anger. Now, he wasn't mad because they did something to him. He was mad because they had no compassion on a man who had a withered arm, and they weren't happy with him when his arm was healed because they were too concerned about something that wasn't even the law of Moses in the first place about what it was to do good or bad on the Sabbath. They completely missed the whole point because they wanted their way. They wanted their traditions bound. No wonder Jesus looked around about them with anger. That was righteous indignation. I still say today that we need some strong study concerning how to be righteously indignant. When Paul walked on Athens and saw all those idols, all this stuff, these false gods, it says his spirit was stirred within him. He was upset. He knew the truth. He knew what they needed. They didn't. And he even says, whom you ignorantly worship, I now declare unto you. So he wanted to teach them. There's something wrong when we become happy with everything around about us and none of it bothers us. We can't have our spirit stirred within us. We're not righteously indignant at the things that are sending countless millions to hell every day. That ought to upset a member of the church and all that being a member of the church means. Well, that's another one. But here's warning sign number three. Ties in with the rest. Selfishness. Selfishness. While in the field, I mentioned Cain killed Abel. 
At that moment, Cain didn't just kill Abel physically. Cain really took his own life, too. Whenever a person hates his fellow man, John says he abides in spiritual death. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. John used this very sad story to exhort Christians to choose a different course in their personal relationships. Listen to him in 1 John chapter 3, 11 through 12. And remember, he's writing to those who are already members of the church. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Now listen, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and therefore, and wherefore slew he him? In other words, why did he kill him? Here's why. There wasn't anything evil Cain, uh, Abel had done because his own works, Cain's works, were evil and his brother's righteous. Brethren, learn a lesson. When you do right, when you treat other people right, and I say right as the Bible defines the right, when you're what you ought to be toward God in your worship and your own personal life, and you do good, there are people who are doing evil that that just rubs them the wrong way. They want you to be where they are in their approach to things, and they don't want you to be, as they would see it, better than they are. And you hear that sometimes, or I guess you think you're just a cat's meow. Or I guess you think you, you're just more pious than anybody else. Brethren, godly living before ungodly people reminds them of their ungodliness, and they can't stand that. And so they have to pull you down to where they are, and it's sort of like the two little kids in the sand pile, maybe three years old. One wants the sand bucket, and the other one doesn't want him to have it. So he calls him an ugly name, and the one with the bucket looks at him and says, you're another one. And they're happy. They go right on doing what they were doing. There's something about that psychologically besides it being sin in us that when we're evil, if I can just get J.D. to do evil, I'm happy for both of us to be evil and we can go just right along together. You're another one. That's always been... You watch it, brethren. It, I watched it too many years. Besides learning it from the Bible, you watch people in sin and they will do their best to accuse you of what they're guilty of. Now, I said Joseph Goebbels, Dr. Goebbels of uh, Nazi fame and Hitler's propaganda minister in Germany. And I was one of his advice. Whatever they accuse you of, and it may be true, and with them it usually was, just turn around and accuse them of the same thing. And just keep saying it over and over again. And guess what it's going to do with a lot of folks? It's going to stick. <coughs> Let's see, what did the Jews say about Jesus when he stood before Pilate after 1,500 years of being taught the law of Moses to lead them unto Christ? What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And what was their answer? Crucify him. Crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. Have people changed. It's intriguing to observe the connection between Cain's attitude toward God and his own actions toward his brother Abel. The two are inseparably linked. If he would substitute his will for God in worship, he wouldn't hesitate to elevate his will over that of his brother. But the last thing about people, Cain's way is a way of selfishness. And those who are closest to one who is traveling this road should beware. Friendships, marriages, and relationships of every description have been callously destroyed as a result of consuming self-interest. Although fully aware of what has transpired, the Lord confronted Cain with the question, where is Abel, your brother? Now, do you think God didn't know? Or was that for Cain's benefit, Genesis 4 9? 
and listen to the cold, callous response of Cain to that question. Am I my brother's keeper? Genesis 4, 9. Where love is lacking, trouble soon will follow. And the golden rule has been replaced by the law of the jungle. When Christians come to a fork in the road of any relationship, the inspired apostle Paul urged them to choose the more excellent way. And we won't take time to read all of that, but it starts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, all the way through chapter 13 and verse 7. That's the more excellent way. And to sum it up, it's simply this. If God, in seeking your highest good because he loves all men, is to get you into heaven and whatever it takes to get you to heaven, then that's the attitude of the spiritual body of Christ and we as members in particular. And we can't deviate from the truth, the gospel, that gets us from earth to heaven because there's not anything else that will get you from earth to heaven. So our love of God and love of his word and love of the souls of men, women, boys, and girls who are out of harmony with it is to not compromise the truth in our lives and in the teaching of the gospel. The most loving path is always the one that urges people to follow closely Christ's teachings in our own doing so. Romans 13, 8 through 10, Paul said to our brethren in Rome of 2,000 years ago, Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Jesus said, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. Well, how do I know how to deal with me? How do I know how to deal with my family? How do I know how to deal with my brethren in Christ? How do I know how to deal with my neighbor or anybody? I've got to be informed by the word of God. Jesus has to tell me how that works. And thus, that's how I deal with it. In closing, there's warning sign number four. And you'll see it all involves self. Every bit of the, all of these involve self. And it's self-deceit. Self-deceit. Now, to be deceived uh, yourself, to self-deceive yourself, <laughs> is to tell yourself a lie and believe it. People get pretty good at that. It was Cain's way to lie about sin. Rather than face his guilt which he would not. He attempted to cover it up the same way he tried to, I'm sure, try to cover his brother, his brother's death. For a fleeting moment, he thought he might not be discovered, but that wasn't the case, was it? Sort of like Jonah fleeing God and thinking he'd run away from him in this life. So he thought he'd take a big boat trip, but he can't escape God. And you know you can't escape yourself. I remember one time a brother saying and talking with a brother who had committed sin, finally got him to come face to face with the fact this is happening to you because of your own choice. He said, when I got him to realize that this thing, he said, he found out he had a conscience. Some people do evil and they never realize what their conscience can do to them. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost when the proof was in that you folks have taken with wicked hands and crucified and slain the Son of God. What happened to them? They were pricked in their heart. They cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? As a result of Cain's sin, he could no longer pursue the occupation that he loved. Go back and read that. Changed his whole life. Rather than living a settled life of a farmer, he would spend his days in a wander, as a wandering fugitive. Well, God still remembered mercy, however, and placed a mark upon Cain as a warning not to kill him. Yet the consequences of Cain's sin were almost unbearable. He had to live with having murdered his brother, and that would never go away. Broken his parents' heart, and that would never go away. And inflicted terrible burden on his own family, and that would never go away. In other words, the tentacles of sin touched the lives of all who loved him, certainly beginning with himself. Jude declared that false teachers are going the way of Cain. 
False teachers are descendants of Cain because they prefer their own way to God's way. They're selfish and quick to vent their anger on anyone who opposes them. They defy God while constantly denying any wrongdoing whatsoever. In the end, those who choose to walk in the way of Cain must also share in his punishment. What shall we say to these things? What I said in the beginning. In the light of God's rightly divided truth, choose your way exceedingly carefully. Every person must choose a path of traveling life. And Jesus narrowed the path to two choices. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. It's amazing how Jesus just reduces things down to here it is, plain as a nose on your face. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For well, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. The broad way leading to destruction or the narrow way leading to life eternal. And that's it. You can try to figure out other ways. There are no other ways. When standing at the crossroads, the natural choice seems to be the wide road. It's easy. It gratifies the affairs of this world and your flesh. It seems to be the easier route. Let's put it that way. But it's a route that leads to misery. How do I know? Walk in the way of Cain, and you'll see. But that's already been done for us. It's written there in the beginning, so we can see. And it says, don't go, don't go. The prophets have always encouraged people to make a wise choice of the road they will travel. Listen to the Old Testament to the great prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 12, 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Then the great weeping prophet Jeremiah in chapter 6 and verse 16. How these things have echoed down through faithful gospel preachers and Bible teachers to this present day. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now here's the sad part about it. But they said, we will not walk therein. The right way has been lit by God. Psalm 119, verses 104 and 105. You know it. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. The word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He has opened a new and living way, Hebrews 10, 20, and the whole New Testament system of salvation. If you live with that, you won't walk the way of Cain. So what path are you traveling today? Is it the way of Cain? A lot of people are doing it and think they're just perfect with God. But that way is a way paved with selfishness, hatred, lies, and wrath. Are we going to follow the way of Christ? The way paved with humility, love, obedience, honesty, and grace. And be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Now here's the thing as we leave you. If you don't like the direction you're traveling, it's not too late to change. But each one of us must make that change. If you're so subject to the great gospel call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Call